In its own day, Oxyrhynchus was um, quite unusual, probably, for an Egyptian town. Um, reading the papyri, pap um, we tend to get the idea that it was a sort of overgrown village, and people have been a bit dismissive about Oxyrhynchus because it's not like uh, one of the great urban sites that you can visit in the Mediterranean. There's virtually nothing standing there. But the more you read in the papyri, and uh, the number of huge buildings there are, particularly by the second century AD, it must have been one of the largest cities in Egypt and indeed in Roman North Africa. We certainly know that it's a new build theatre of the second century AD, which was um, part excavated by Flinders Petrie, uh, was without doubt the biggest theatre in Roman North Africa. And remember, there are some pretty spectacular ones um, in, in modern Algeria and Tunisia to compare with that, uh, possibly holding 13,000 people. Not quite as big as, say, Syrian Antioch, but still pretty impressive by ancient standards and much bigger than anything else found in Egypt, even in Alexandria. Uh, there was a fair bit of knowledge of Oxyrhynchus um, before Grenfell and Hunt got there, um, mainly from literary texts and particularly uh, from Christian texts. It was, in the 4th century, uh, reputed as a great centre of Christianity. Um, there is an, a 4th century account that claims um, that the uh, bishop there had something like 10,000 monks and 20,000 virgins under him, and it, uh, and it had numerous churches. Um, it was indeed that account of its importance as a Christian centre um, that attracted Grenfell and Hunt to this otherwise rather unprepossessing site because they hoped that as a great centre of Christianity, there they would find the early Christian texts which were their primary objective. Uh, most of the material we have from Oxyrhynchus is pretty fragmentary. We have fragments of columns, column um, capitals, uh, various blocks from uh, decorative blocks from streets and theatres. This is fairly typical of the finds from most urban sites of Egypt, most of which were um, pillaged in the 19th century um, because the stone was reused for buildings or uh, to quite a large extent was burnt to produce lime for the um, massive building projects um, of um, Muhammad Ali. Um, but uh, this picture, although very fragmentary at any one site, is pretty consistent over the whole of Egypt. In other words, um, what you can trace various building phases and it is clear that across Egypt, the second century AD, was the great face of urban building and decoration where almost every Egyptian town of any pretensions uh, got a theatre, colonnades, baths, um, various uh, uh, Greek-style temples uh, and so on. There are excavations ongoing at several of the village sites in the Fayum and because some of them are at a high, quite um, uh, a, a high um, a level above sea level, um, they are still pretty dry and uh, finds of papyrus and indeed of ostraca are still being made in um, some considerable quantity, not perhaps the massive deposits of the um, early years of the 20th century, but still in quite some number. Cartonnage um, has been one of our main sources of um, significant uh, large ancient documents. Uh, Cartonnage means a sort of papier-mâché um, uh, wrapping for mummies. Uh, that was um, made in the late Ptolemaic and into the early Roman period, there was a distinct phase of its use, whereby people took old texts uh, and, 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 and soaked them uh, in water to, um, to loosen them up and, and then rolled them round uh, mummies um, just like wrappings. Previously they'd used linen, they then reverted to linen, but there is this phase where cartonnage, as we call it, was used. Whether anything uh, big, really big is going to be found, you can never quite tell. Um, uh, there is the possibility that someone will come across a cache in the abandoned rooms of a house which will contain a number of rolls. There haven't, I think, been finds like that recently. On the other hand, there are uh, still, uh, in some areas, probably um, mummified crocodiles and humans to be found, which were uh, uh, wrapped in cartonnage. And, uh, and indeed, in many museums, there are still um, mummies that are unwrapped. Nowadays, of course, the question is, do you preserve the mummy or do you unwrap it to find Menenda? Um, but the, there are chances, I would say, yes, they're still found in quite um, substantial texts. Indeed, the um, notorious Artemidorus papyrus shows that somewhere around, lurking, whether already excavated or not, there are still considerable texts. Uh, also, in terms of the burial uh, materials from Oxyrhynchus, we find
uh, from the Roman um, period, we find that the whole gamut, as we do elsewhere, of um, tombs very much in the Roman style with women in togas reclining at dinners represented on them, through to fairly traditional um, mummification um, with the traditional paintings of Egyptian deities and rituals uh, on the mummies. So that, uh, from, from what we can tell of the urban built environment and of the funerary practices of the um, middling to elite, uh, the Opsirincus was pretty typical. It just was a grand example of what was going on generally in Egypt at the time. I mean, my, my personal favourite, however, would be uh, something which we can no longer see, which was seen by um, uh, Denon, one of the uh, savants travelling with Napoleon's armies in 1798, and he drew um, part of one massive column uh, of what we call a tetrastulon, which is a, a late imperial form of it's a massive four-columned marker um, over a crossroads. There are some very fine examples of these still standing at Palmyra, for example. And that certainly, um, uh, that now virtual remain, uh, is, I suppose, my personal favourite. The initial excavations turned up uh, gospel texts, uh, which of course were, were very important and, and were published very comparatively quickly, the, especially the, the so-called signs of Jesus. Um, but also uh, what started to appear were many um, te original uh, copies of, of um, Homeric um, epics, other kinds of poetry, uh, which obviously um, has great potential for, for textual criticism uh, with classicists, but um, importantly also a, a whole range of other documents started to appear that were surprising uh, governor's edicts, uh, legal proceedings, private letters, accounts, farm accounts, and uh, really every type of conceivable document through to uh, taxation receipts and census returns. Uh, and these have completely revolutionised our, our picture, not just of everyday life in Roman Egypt, but, but also uh, throughout the Roman Empire. There is a question of, of how typical um, the documents are, because obviously we don't have um, similar documents preserved from other parts of the Roman Empire. Although more recently, for example, with the, the discovery of the Vindolanda tablets and, and other papyrological discoveries in other provinces um, in, the, in the Eastern Empire, uh, show that, the, um, that this material has, has much to tell us about everyday administration um, and, um, and, and everyday life uh, over a full range of, of different subjects. Well, it's the, the private letters that I think are the most interesting uh, and they reveal the same concerns um, amongst the, the, the people of Voxerwinkus and other Roman cities as, as perhaps we might have today about um, uh, relationships between family members, um, fathers writing to sons about um, their education, uh, making sure they're doing their homework, um, and, and other ev everyday things. It, it's, it gives us a, a bottom-up uh, view of the ancient world, which we, we don't have from, from other evidence, and this is what makes it so valuable. As, as an ancient historian, primarily interested in administrative history, um, it's, it's the administrative documents which I think are the most fascinating um, and we have a whole full range of different uh, types of, of administrative documents. But if I were to single out maybe um, particular documents I, I would probably turn to an archive and, um, and one which um, gives us not, not only a, a good picture of, of life in Oxyrhynchus but also gives us an idea about um, how, how such matters might have um, happened in, in ancient Rome itself it is, is um, the series of documents published in volume 40 of the Oxyrhynchus Papyri, the, the so-called uh, Corundal Archive, which uh, gives us a very good idea of um, how corn, free corn distributions to eligible citizens in the city of Oxyrhynchus were uh, administered, but importantly uh, it seems to be modelled very much on the similar um, corn dole, uh, which existed in Rome from the time of Gaius Gracchus, uh, uh, and which we know a good deal about, uh, given the changes made to it by Julius Caesar and, and Augustus.
So it, it gives us a picture, a provincial picture of, of a very Roman thing and uh, perhaps uh, also implies that um, cities were modelling themselves on, on the city of Rome itself and, and it's a, some of its administrative structures. One of the aspects of life in Oxyrhynchus which I'm most interested in is, is corruption um, because it was completely endemic. Um, and affected absolutely everyone within the city. Um, and it, it manifests itself in a whole range of different ways, from, from simple extortion of money uh, through to fraud and embezzlement of the state. Um, and many of, the, many of the aspects of corruption which we see in the texts are very um, familiar to us uh, from other cultures and societies uh, that we know of. There are certainly authors of, who are existed only you know, as a kind of shadow of themselves. Um, and I think that's one of the fascinations. Uh, the authors of whom we knew as re reputation, like Stesichorus, great man, totally lost. Callimachus, great name, totally lost, apart from a few minor works. And now actually we do know what they look like and also how they circulated. Um, Needless to say, well, as Emiliano once said about the Emperor Claudius, my readers may discern the, the sympathy in me of one pedant for another. Um, and perhaps Calimachus is the most professorial of the poets that we have. But it is very remarkable, I think, um, to see somebody who was the great exemplar for Roman poets of poetic uh, sophistication. And who, as we see it, is a rather Stravinsky-like figure playing all sorts of extraordinary games with the genre of the past, and postmodern in some sense of the word. Um, and at last, one does actually see the full diversity of it all. And indeed, one frame from Oxyrhynchus, which is the proem of his Aitia poem, in which he rebukes his critics um, for preferring um, <coughs> a load of old nonsense to the pure dewdrop of poetic inspiration and um, serves, I think, still it reminds me somewhat of the beginning of Hugh Selwyn Moberly. Um, oh, my muse, let us talk of affection. We shall get ourselves rather disliked. And that's the Calimachian tone. And we now recover the Greek readings of it. I mean, in one way, I sympathize with Grenfell and Hunt their first text they published, Pioxy 1, number 1, was what we know now as the Gospel of Thomas, an apocryphal gospel. And that was deeply important at that time because, I mean, the way in which Victorian religious faith had been partly undermined or limited by ideology and anthropology and zoology, they went on to a different tack of looking for, in some cases, historical verification through archaeology of what happens in the Bible and from ever earlier manuscripts of scripture which would improve the idea that they were authentic. So one of the first things they actually found was this apocryphal gospel, which is what they set out to look for in the first place. Well, partly, of course, it was they put them in a position to look at the origins of the Christian book because one thing we know about Christianity is, when I say is, well, of course the Bagnall wouldn't agree, but nonetheless everybody else knows that uh, the Christians effectively popularised the Codex, the modern book form, instead of the role. In that sense, then, the, the, the change from role to Codex is the most extraordinary thing to happen to the book before the age of printing. In that sense, it's a Christian form. Uh, and that became much clearer with the founds from Egypt. In another way, of course, it also showed that more apocryphal gospels were circulating than the ones that we know, which also brought us into the church before its various internal struggles led to something called orthodoxy. Orthodoxy being, of course, the creed of the winners. I think in some ways, of course, it provided a historical, as you might say, an anti-evangelical view of the early church and that was actually quite important. After all, the evangelical view was that there were four Gospels and quite likely that they were written in English. Yeah. The, the finding of Papyri was a way of actually showing what a very broad spectrum the early church was and also, I think, um, 
it enabled them to try and enter into the social foundations of early Christianity to see why it was that the Christians silenced and their book form trapped, which is, of course, the turning point of our civilization. From our point of view, uh, Grenfell hadn't dug there, of course, as you know, except for one mound, which they couldn't reach because it had a shrine, the tomb of, a cop of a, an Arabic saint on top. And in the 30s, the Italians got permission to dig that, and they then, in fact, recovered parts of finds which matched with those of Grenfell and Hunt. Uh, now, I think, though, Dominic may correct me, uh, the interest is on, the current excavation is on the Arab town. And Oxford went on being a very important centre up to the 12th century. Um, it's recorded that the Caliphal Palace in Baghdad had tapestries in it made at Oxford in Egypt. So it remained a very important centre. And that's something we knew very little about until the current season. But I think probably, as they used to say, the best finds are made in old collections, not in new digs. Um, there is still to come from the old finds in Oxyrhynchus quite a number of surprises. The finds from Oxyrhynchus, the old finds of the Grevel and Hunt ex uh, excavation were stored in 120 large, very large cardboard boxes, uh, tastefully housed in sheets of the Oxford University Gazette because that is quite good paper. It's being replaced, I, by, in fact, by acid-free paper, bit by bit. Um, but the gazettes were used by Graham von Hunt because to start with, of course, it was a very ill-financed operation. Basically, two, two gentlemen on the spot. Uh, they made the tin boxes for their finds out of old kerosene cans from the site, sent them back in this, and then they used the gazette to house them and they sorted them out and then we got our cardboard boxes. Um, it doesn't sound much, but in fact I suppose the contents must be something like 50,000 papyri. The one fragment I'd be least willing to throw back is the extraordinary fragment of one of the Paeans of Pindar where he describes the history of the temples at Delphi. And when we come in, he's talking about the temple which was made out of beeswax and feathers and how it was then blown away by a great wind. And then the next temple was made entirely of bronze and over the doorway there were sirens made of gold whose song was so enchanting that visitors to the temple stood there and starved to death because they couldn't tear themselves away. Well, this is a wonderful piece of poetry worthy of any anthology. At the same time, it's myth, in the way that myth attracted me to the Greeks, this extraordinary construction, as it were. Oxyrhynchus has enormously enhanced our uh, uh, knowledge of the ancient world in uh, documentary as well as literary ways, but speaking as someone who's primarily interested in the new literary text that's come on, I think the great revelation has been the works of Menander. Um, Menander was the uh, single most important uh, comedian, arguably, who has ever lived, certainly of the ancient world, enormously important and influential seminal, really, for the Western the classical uh, comic tradition, and yet up until the first appearances of papyrus texts of Menander uh, with Brentwell and Hunt, they, uh, our knowledge of Menander was entirely owed to uh, very free and in some ways misleading Roman adaptations which were known to the Renaissance and known to Shakespeare and uh, the families of the classical tradition and comedy from the Renaissance, but we didn't have the Greek texts that those Roman texts were adapted from and their rediscovery has completely transformed our sense of how one of the major art forms of the Western world developed. Menander is a very complex writer. He's a product of early Hellenistic Athens. He's writing in extremely turbulent times and he's caught between two worlds. He's caught between the uh, nostalgia for the democratic world of classical Athens and uh, a very different political world, a very different kind of citizenship that's emerging in uh, the wake of Alexander's conquests and the uh, elimination 
of democracy as a defining aspect of Athenian citizenship, but at the same time a vast expansion of the notion of Greekness, uh, uh, a colouring of the map Greek all the way from the, uh, the Western Mediterranean to the Hindu Kush. And uh, that expanded set of, uh, of cities that call themselves Greeks um, and the sense of a kind of common identity and heritage is one of the things that Menandrian's contemporaries were addressing. Um, so within his own world, Menander is a significant figure, but he's also a significant figure for our sense of how comedy itself uh, has evolved because up until the reappearance of Menander in Greek, all we had really was the plays of Aristophanes, which belonged to a very different, very uh, fast evolving but early phase in the history of the tradition. And what you see uh, happening in Menander is a convergence of the values, the uh, dramatic interests of tragedy and comedy into a plot led. Uh, character-based, highly naturalistic fusion that would become the template for comedy uh, throughout the rest of its history. It's screamingly funny if you ever get the opportunity to see it performed, but it's also deeply serious. Uh, Menandrian comedy is uh, an extremely dense, philosophically inflected, politically complex and interestingly politically compromised uh, art form um, that reflects the contradictions and the uh, obsessions of its time in ways that are not really mapped by any other kind of evidence from that, from that era. One of the great expansions in our knowledge of ancient literature recently uh, has been uh, the huge explosion in the numbers of known Greco-Roman novels. Um, the, probably the last great literary form to emerge from the ancient world is these multi-volume works of prose fiction, some of which are of huge ambition and literary sophistication. And until uh, the Oxyrhynchus era, we really uh, had no sense of the scope or the sheer numbers of these texts. Uh, we now uh, know of uh, a good 30 uh, Greek novels that survive in uh, at least some kind of fragmentary state. Um, many of them very incomplete. One of the frustrations about working with ancient fiction is that if you've only got uh, one paragraph or so, it's very difficult to know what the entire multi-volume work uh, would have looked like. But some of them are emerging as truly fascinating texts, and the more we know of the corpus, the more we're able to map what seems to have been one of the most uh, intellectually invisible and yet culturally resilient and sophisticated and, uh, and so at least in some ends of the market, popular uh, kinds of uh, literary experiment that the ancient world has produced.